everybody, I have no idea why the first 10 seconds of this were muted. Maybe it's just because we're just too awesome. Doesn't really matter. Enjoy. Called the Veteran's Guide to War. I don't think, uh, I probably shouldn't say it like that. I probably just like say it very kindly. Like the Veteran's Guide to War. There, that's much more, that's much more consumer friendly, you know? Um, but along, along the way, I've picked up uh, two more folks here on the uh, the triple headed dragon of doom that we call a group check. Um, one who you've seen before, uh, you've seen JF, JF Messon, uh, someone who you have uh, certainly seen if you have been a fan of, of slices and dices for a while. He's he's always there. He's always he's always hiding in the background, waiting to waiting to shank someone. Um, uh, I enjoy adding my chaos. Hell yeah, and I approve of it one hundred percent. And a new face. Uh, to the channel is Chris. Uh, those of you who have been with us for a while on Discord may know her as Game Hen, um, and Chris is here uh, to put in her expertise uh, and her commentary as we go through this particular amazing supplement. And on audio, direct from Sweden, we have the man himself. Uh, hey. And there he is. That's Jesper Nilsson, Syria. Um, I guess you know uh, Sweden doesn't allow. Uh, video chat you know they're they're so far behind <laughs> they're just like throwing sticks at yep. each other um it's just a technology thing it's fine um but we can hear him and that's important and thank you very much for being here jesper okay um we're gonna get into it pretty quick um before we get into impressions sort of first impressions i want to just turn to jf and i'm going to turn to chris and i want to ask the two of you when i first came to the two of you and said hey how would you like to um how would you like to do a review on on slices and dices for group check uh for this really awesome supplement um that has yet to really sort of be uh like really uh it's still in what what, what version of is it is it in jasper it's in like 0. 0.85 0. 0.9 something like that yeah 0. 0.85 0. 0.85 yeah. so technically i mean look the beta of baldur's gate 3 is probably better than most actual video games so that's saying something and i think in this case the beta of this particular supplement um is better than a lot of supplements i see on uh on dm's guild and and elsewhere so I think it comes with a lot of love and a lot of work and a lot of a lot of like a lot of play testing, a lot of backing. So keen to see how this thing works out. Really cool. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to turn to you and say, what 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 about this particular um, uh, uh, D and D five E supplement made you go, oh yeah, I want I want some of that. So the... I'm. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was doing another playtest for someone else, and uh, we had the opportunity where between a Horn of Valhalla and a Druid, we could have had up to 96 combatants, not including the party. So this felt like something I wanted to take a look at before that happened. Okay, so this sounds like something that you want to use. Uh with these rules, I would do that. I would not do it in regular 5e because every round would take four hours. Okay. Okay, cool. Chris, what about you? So I'm running a Call of the Nether Deep game, Ooh. and I wanted to find a better, more engaging and interesting way to get the history of the background of Chapter 2 across, right? Because otherwise it's like, well, if you talk to this NPC and you ask this question, they'll tell you this. And then you can connect the dots. And it's like, that's super boring. <laughs> so I was like, you know what's fun? Visions, dreams, and quests that are like in the liminal spaces. They're fun for players. They're excellent fun for GMs. Mm -hmm. And great time all around. So when you're like, hey, mass combat rules, I'm like, that's just what I need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I put together a scenario where I talk to an NPC and the NPC is like, hey, want to meditate with me? And then they go into vision quest. And the dude the chapter is about, it's like, oh, hey, yeah, that's a vision of me in the past. I remember like yesterday when we took the capital, I'm like, we're going to experiment with mass combat. Here's a PDF for you. And I gave each of them a custom commander, a custom unit. Nice. And gave them a quick like here's the tactics you know here's your stats and it was really easy to put together i spent most of my time just flavoring things and i was able to tie in 
all of this background and history I wanted to get across in an interesting way, tie in some character background fluff, and then just make a great time. We were done. Everyone was like, that was so fun. I got to command an army. That's a, a, amazing. I'm uh, Look, I'll, the zeitgeist for this kind of stuff with the thing, uh, the thing, the, with the new uh, campaign book, the Dragonlance book that came out, um, which is... I don't know if uh, I'm not going to spoil that because if those of you want to run it, um, go for it. It's it, it's actually it, I've read it and it's it's really great and it has a lot of confluence with a special board game that you can purchase separately, uh, where you get to run mass battles with you know the versions of uh, sorry the the armies of uh, uh, of the uh, essentially of the Knights of Salamnia against the armies of the of the dragon warriors of Tachesis. And that board game in and of by itself, I'm sold. Like, I love board games. You should see my closet. My wife hates the fact that I have like 300 fucking board games in my closet. I'm sure that everybody watching this channel may have something similar. Uh, or, or if you don't, then go out and buy yourself some more board games. Yeah. It's not my problem how many you have. It's your, your problem. Um, but hey, um, this particular board game, you can, as you go through the Dragonlance book, there are parts which are like, okay, and then there is a fight with an army. Here's where you open up your board game and play this particular scenario out. And I, I was thinking, oh my God. I mean, Jesper beat them to the punch with this friggin' amazing supplement with the Veteran's Guide to War. Because it's simple, it's fun, it's got a lot of different uh, bells and whistles and buttons and levers that you can push when you want to actually do something like armies fighting armies um and uh it, it, it's modular in that uh you can custom tailor your army based on you know you, you could throw a whole bunch of like um what, what do they call them uh jesper they're ep what are they, what does the ep stand for again is it experience it's not experience uh, and enhancement points. enhancement points so you can buy enhancement points for your army and just like have two armies just fucking smash each other in the face. If you have like 15 uh, enhancement points per army, they can kit out their armies however they want and then just go at it. And I think that's fucking amazing. So. Yeah. It, sorry, I must say, it's crazy that an official release of a war module is coming out now because this is almost finished. It's crazy. And it's, uh, yeah. So I uh, might um, uh, I, I might sort of, you know, when I buy that board game uh, come January, when my taxes are done and I actually realize that I have no money and then buy it anyway, um, I will go ahead and try your rule set with that board game and probably have probably have a like a maybe a, as equal or maybe in a better time uh, based on what I'm seeing here. So. I'm actually going to put out a guide for all the battles in, uh, in um, uh, what is it called? Shadow of the Dragon? Yeah, Sh well, it, uh, yeah. is it called Shadow of the Dragon? I think it's called Shadow of the Dragon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, my God. To, to be used with this system. Oh, uh, dude, my heart just exploded with joy. You just made me a non-Grinch today. Like and it's going to be Three sizes bigger. <laughs> it's going to be free? Oh, yeah. oh, oh, my wallet thanks you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Amazing. So without further ado, if I hadn't hyped this enough, and by the way, I'm not being paid by Jasper, just in just in, in his love. Um, uh, let's get into it, shall we? So here we go. The Veteran's Guide to War. War. As Red Platinum says in the chat, war never changes. Well, actually, kind of does. So whoever said that, you're wrong. Um, however, what we've got here, what we got here is, uh, how to you, it's, it's very, it's, what is it? It's 40 pages, even with the copyright thing at the back. Um, it's split into part one, part two, part three, part four, and some appendices. Part one are the basic rules. Part two are the extended rules. Part three are the player options. Part four are the modified rules which I love, by the way, in case you want to really sit and spice this in your game. And then the appendices, which you should definitely use. Um, all right, so there's a whole bunch of credits. Jesus, how many fans do you have? That's a lot of fans. God, look at all those people. 
It's not updated though, so don't focus too much. <laughs> That's a needs lot more. of people, needs man. More. You need more. You need more fans. Okay. Okay. So here, skip, skip. How many fans you had? Just how many thumbs to add? All right. Um, and here we go. Introduction: How to use this book. Uh, like I said, it's split into four parts. Um, and it explains what this is all about. I love the the majority of the art. Um, it looks yeah. like it's common. Uh, common, uh, common content. Is that right? Yeah, it looks like you had a Hieronymus Bosch piece in there, maybe. Probably, yeah. Yeah, all, most artists uh, is. I think that almost all of the art is uh, public domain. Public domain. Yeah. There's a big deal. Like, there's a big debate now. Um, in the in the D and D, uh, geosphere about whether or not one should use, um, AI art, which everyone is seeming to you know go gaga over um because hey look i can make a squirrel wearing a helmet and he's standing on a tuft of grass with a face that looks like uh, uh looks like uh martha stewart like you could just type that into an ai and whammo you get something eerily similar uh, or whether or not you should go out to artists if if you want to support local artists which you always should um and enlist them to bring their art into your product um in, uh, dm's guild or or not um there's that sort of uh debate raging right now i'm i'm on the fence to be honest because if you can get something if it's ai generated it has no copyright protection absolutely uh, that is true uh, is that... the court has recently ruled that uh for something to enjoy copyright protection it has to be made by a human right it was that case with the the macaw that took its own selfie whether or not he had a uh, copyright. Wait, a macaw? Yeah, it like took the, the photographer's cam? camera and took the picture of himself. And uh, another uh, publication used it without permission. I would like to see that selfie. Was he doing? Was he doing like? Is he doing like a strike? Big old thing? grin. Oh my god! Amazing. Yeah. Well, GMs that I know will use AI programs to be like, okay, I just need someone who looks like a bounty hunter and an alien. Here's five seconds. I got something. Right. I think the dividing line is if you are making money, you should give people money. You should mm -hmm. pay people for their work. I mean, it's one thing if you're like, I just need a potato over there. It's another yeah, but thing. That if... potato could be so artistically rendered by the right artist. True. You know, yeah. I'll always go for the artist myself. I agree. Yeah. I I support uh, artists unless I'm lazy. Yeah. I'm just kidding. There's That's another <laughs> legal issue brewing where some AI engines have scanned artwork without the permission of the copyright holders. Oh, well, here's a question then. Yeah. If you take an AI piece of art, not to like derail our amazing discussion here, but if you take a piece of AI art, Gint. derailed. <laughs> Sorry, that train went that way. If you take a piece of AI art and you enhance it with your own artist, artistic license, you draw over it, what have you, then it's still what? It's your artwork. That's like tracing. Yeah. Feels like. Yeah, that's the like you must have X degree of change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Well, the debate rages on, and I will stay way the fuck out of it. Um, here we go. Basic rules. So the way massive, uh, massive combat works, as opposed to the wonderful player on monster combat that we find within 5e and other role playing games, is you got a lot of peoples fighting a lot of peoples, and what they'll what they'll call it is a unit. Now, we discussed this a little bit before the before the session started, in that a lot of today's um uh, uh uh shall we shall we call them uh, board gamers 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 in general if you call yourself a gamer you you could be lots of different types you could be a video gamer you could be a board gamer you could be a role player you could be a lot of different things you could be a war gamer yeah. um and i think that the discrepancy with that is there is a distinct divide if you go to like your average hobby game store sometimes of, of the kinds of people who state very very uh succinctly 
I I don't play Dungeons and Dragons, but I do play war games. Or the opposite. I don't play war games, but I do play uh, role-playing games. Because there's sort of a left-brain, right-brain approach, I think, to that kind of dichotomy, right? If you play war games, there's no role-playing involved. You put your army down on the table, you fight the other army and see who wins. Role-playing is the opposite. No, we're very much involved in story. Yes, there's some tactical combat and stuff like that, but for the most part, we're really more interested in the role-playing, aka the RP of the RPG, than in the war game I bring a whole bunch of armies and they fight. And what I love about this set is that you t- you you take the the really great things about war gaming which is at at a lot of the of the heart of this particular uh supplement and infuse it not only with 5e clearly but also with a lot of role playing um uh, enhancements so that you can really invest the story into the worry did i fucking say that right the st- that's awful. Yeah. Ugh, I feel like I'm <laughs> going to kill myself. Maeve's, Maeve is cringing somewhere right now. Either that or she is absolutely enthralled with that really bad play on words. She does like bad puns. No, yes, she, she, likes, does. she likes great puns. And she's a much better pun meister than I would ever be in my life. But yes, uh, the sto- bring the story into the worry. You heard it here, folks. Copyrighted Slices and Dices 2022. Trademark. Bing! Trademark. Yes, exactly. I don't understand the difference between copyright and trademark. Whatever. That's why I don't publish shit. Anyway. um, So, yeah. Basic rules. You create a unit. A unit is a group of people within uh, a certain amount of of the same type of people. That that way, those types of of, of fighters uh, are distinct from another type of unit. And the way that that works is beautifully and very simply rendered here in the basic rules is if you have a type of monster or just overall character uh, type within the monster manual, you can make a unit of those types of creatures and or humanoids or, and or whatevers. You could have a unit of, of 100 flumps. That's right. Oh, now you're giving me ideas. Hundred, the hundred flump army 100 unit. Flump. <laughs> yeah, it's just floating there, like seven nation army, hundred. <laughs> um, you can do dragon cavalry. You can. You can have mounted. Uh, you know, have flumps on dragons. What have I done? Um, but the concept is that you take a whole bunch of these different individual units, and uh, and and divide a lot of the statistics of that particular unit that you would find in the monster manual into individual portions of that unit, depending on how big the unit is. Which means if you got, as uh, Jesper says here, if you got a specific NPC, like let's call our, our particular example here, a veteran, the veteran is an NPC, uh, the veteran has an, a- an armor class, it has hit points, it has attacks, it has saves, it has ability scores, etc., etc. You're going to have a unit of veterans. And that unit has X amount of veterans in it. Well, how do we determine how strong that unit is? We take the veteran, we divide the veteran's hit points by the number of veterans in the unit. Did I get that right? No, sorry, wait. Here we go. Divide divide it by 10. Divide it by 10 and round it to the nearest whole number. That's right. And then you multiply that number by the number of veterans in the unit. So in this case, as you can see here by the first column here, the veterans unit uh, hit points are 58. You divide it by 10 and round up. And that's six. So the individual hit points or IHP of that unit uh, or of the, sorry, of the members of that unit are six. So no matter how many people are in the unit, it's going to be six times something. Yeah. 
and then there are, as per the example here, 25 units, sorry, sorry, 25 members in that unit, 25 veterans, 25 times 6, 150 total hit points in that unit. Pretty simple. Um, did I miss anything, Jesper? I think I got everything, right? Yep. Super. So that's, that's how you determine the strength of that particular unit. The size of the unit on the map depends on how many uh, members are in that unit. From what I'm reading here, if it's anywhere, and there's a lovely little table here that tells you, uh, here on, on the bottom of page one, that if you have, oops, sorry, if you have anywhere between one and 50 small, or sorry, tiny uh, size members, that will take up a 15 by 15 square. Now, that's another thing. The maps in a massive battle are obviously going to have larger uh, uh, swaths of land than your average encounter map because it's a massive battle and there are many more uh, uh, people on the map. But you don't want to put like 150 people into a 15-foot square. So what instead you do is you take a representative token, let's call them, for that particular unit and put it in that square. And the square uh, units in these massive combat battles are 15 by 15 as opposed to a 5 by 5 square. So you actually have a 15 by 15 square, so you can do it in roll 20. You could just change your grid to instead of 5, uh, 70 pixels equals 5 feet. You make 70 pixels equals 15 feet. And then throw your map down and then start throwing your units down on the table because they're each individually going to be at the smallest 15 by 15 feet. Um, as you guys can see, small, medium, uh, depending on how many uh, members are in the unit, they will all take up 15 by 15 squares. But then the more members are in the unit, the larger the unit gets, clearly. So those will take up a 30 by 30 square. So that's a large sized, right? That's a four, that's a four square unit. And then the really big uh, units with either the, a large amount of people or large creatures in it will take up larger and even larger and even larger amounts of the map. 45 by 45, 60 by 60, all the way up to, Jesus, what is 135 by 135? What is that, like a 7 by 7? 9 by 9. Jesus. 9 by 9. And that's gargant That's a, up to 100 gargantuan creatures on a battlefield. There is something else to note about the 15 by 15. It scales really well with our normal 5 by 5s. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a 9 square 5 by 5. Right. So if you have maps that you've already used that have a scale and you're returning to that place and having a battle, it becomes very easy to scale it out to what you need for a, a larger battle. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and even if you aren't planning to use a battle map, uh, for instance, I didn't use a battle map for mine. I drew a layout of a fortress and divided it into zones. So you had zone one, this is the gatehouse, zone two, this is the bailey. Zone three is the yard, you go through the bailey, and then zone five is the tower. So that way we could just like quick and loose, because I've got some people that are on their phones and to look at things. So yep, absolutely. just simplify it down. And this grid was still very helpful for go going, okay, well, a large unit is going to be the only one that can fit in the space that I have in mind. So this unit, I'm going to tell them, okay, you have to wait till two small units run through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense. So even if, yeah, even if you're, you know, going mapless, theater of the mind, still very useful. Nice. That is very, uh, very, very good for uh, those of us who love to draw and don't like to buy maps or have an addiction to buying maps from certain people who may in fact be listening sorry jasper okay so <laughs> jasper's like theater of the mind what is this nonsense <laughs> how dare can you I, can i can i steal theater that of the theater <laughs> can, can i steal that game hand for uh, chris from uh for the Absolutely. Modifier rooms? yeah awesome um, okay, let's keep on, let's keep on moseying. Essentially, unit size is, as I said, based on the number of, uh, of members or of the size of the units within, uh, sorry, the size of the members of that unit. So the larger the, the people in the unit, the larger the 
the unit size is going to get. Um, There's also uh, the number of units changes how much damage yes. it does on an attack. Over 50 individuals uh, or up to. double damage for all attacks when the unit has 50 or less individuals. Mm -hmm. Quadruple when they have 50 to uh, 51 to 100. Mm -hmm. um, that makes the math so much easier uh, with the larger IHP totals that you're going to have. Having that multiplier makes it go faster and having an easy way to delineate where forces start taking attrition damage, basically, on their ability to continue to wage combat is really handy to have for when you want to show that the opposing army's morale is breaking they're starting to flee agreed and that is a key key factor is that when the units start losing the individuals with inside of it the size of that unit starts jesus am i am i saying this right the size of the, the size unit starts to shrink changes too, yeah the yeah. size of my unit yeah. started to shrink Ah. <laughs> I need to start drinking, folks. Going to have to do some recruiting. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We're going to have to recruit because the size of my unit is shrinking. Okay, let's uh, let's just keep going. <clears throat> Somebody quit that. Uh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. Um, here we go. With the fact that your grid size is now 15 by 15, the minimum range of your melee attacks is not 5 feet, but 15 feet. Um, and if a specific stat block has like a 10-foot reach... That would only uh, work if that reach was greater than 15 feet. Which, to be perfectly honest, if you have a reach of greater than 15 feet uh, with your melee attack, then, wow, what are you, what are you swinging with, man? Um, Halberd on a... Uh, uh, on a, on a bugbear. Yeah, a bugbear. Uh, Halberd on a potion of growth. Yeah. I was going to say solars with, with pikes. It's true. <laughs> Um, a reach of 20 feet that actually rounds up because it goes from 20 feet up to two squares on the battlefield because it goes past the 15 foot um, uh, 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 delineator. And units who have ranged attacks have that particular range. So if you've got a bow with 80 feet range, it's going to be 80 feet. Just, just track it out and see if it lands within the unit that you're trying to aim at. Now, here's the cool-ass shit that makes unit-to-unit -unit combat so much spicier and so much nicer. Um, commanders, right? So you've got a unit, and it's commanded by an NPC, and that NPC could, just could, be one of the players in your game. Holy shit, I get to command an army, as you said, Chris, mm -hmm. right? And that commander is part of that unit. And, I mean, units don't have to have a commander, as it says here, but they have great benefits when they do. When you take over a unit, you lose all of your normal actions. Oh, man, but I wanted to fireball while I was a commander. Wonderful. I'm sorry. You're now a commander. You cannot fireball. But you can command Actually, a unit of fireballs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, when you are a commander, you add your hit points divided by 10 as temporary hit points to the unit, which is awesome, especially if you're like a barbarian. <laughs> I have 275 hit points. I add 27 hit points to the total hit point maximum of my unit of, uh, of flumps. Come at me, bro. Um, but these temporary hit points can only be added once a day. And commander actions can take special actions at the top of their unit's turn. Now, I have a question, Jesper. This, this I had a, a, a quandary about. Let's call initiative what no, a normal initiative is, right? Each unit rolls initiative. Um, and then it, let's say both units are commanded by commanders. Does the commander of each unit get to do their actions first before the unit and then the unit takes their action or do they do it on the unit's action there's a distinct difference and i have a question about what that means um they hmm. they should do it like at 
I think I wrote at the top of the unit's action, uh, unit's turn. Okay. So in other words, yeah. the 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 commanders don't. So the commanders don't roll initiative separately from the units, right? It's not no. like John, who's the commander of unit A, rolls initiative, and then the unit goes, and then Jim, who's the commander of unit B, goes, and then unit B goes. They go within the unit's initiative, correct? Uh, yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Exactly. So The way then, I was looking at it yeah. was it's like a another section to the action economy yep. of a, a regular turn. It's like an extra bonus action kind of thing. It is a... Uh, what what's a good word for it? An inspiring or a uh, because a lot of what you can do is give commands mm -hmm. as those actions. It's a a tactical action. advantage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and um, it should be said also if if you're commander of more than one unit, you all you get commander actions for each and every one of those units when it's the unit's turn oh nice so you can have you can act many different uh, many times during and around with the commander actions okay so let's go ahead with that hypothetical let's say john is the commander of multiple units he's the commander of three units of flumps i'm going with the flumps i'm sorry um three units of flumps 10 flumps in a unit commanding all three of them correct so he's not in a specific unit of flumps. He's just like physically fl like floating behind them, essentially, or like he's not part of um, the three units, but he he is part of um, there are rules for this too later on. Um, that comes in when you get um, like player feats or mm. battle feats for players. Um, but um, uh, you are the commander of of both units. I'm not sure that I wrote this in the rules somewhere. I'm looking, but I can't find it. No uh, but you're 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 a commander of one unit. So you're attached to one unit. But okay. all of the uh, if all three units are commanded by you, it's just because you need to know which unit you are in if that unit would be, get disbanded Got or it. you want to leave that unit because they can be in different places but when you're a commander of more units they pass they have to be within a certain distance um, distance from each other that's yeah. smart yes there's some some and that's what i remember i'm like oh that's like warhammer 240k there has to be some cohesion between the different uh portions of that particular unit otherwise they start to sort of fall apart at the seams. But yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so let's go ahead with um, the commanders, what kind of cool shit that they can do. Um, the commanders on the turn of the unit that they're commanding can <clears throat> perform standard uh, actions here, such as uh, reckless charge. So at the beginning of the unit's turn, they can roll a persuasion which is charisma or strength. That's so cool, right? It doesn't have to be tied to using your charisma modifier. It could be tied to your strength modifier and roll a persuasion check against DC of 18. It's pretty high DC. It's pretty high DC, I'm going to be honest. Um, if successful, a unit you command does plus one damage per five individual members of the unit, rounded down on their next melee attack, if they move at least 30 feet towards the target on their turn. Now, the good thing is that the speed of the, uh, the, of the individual members of the unit is the same as if they are uh, just walking, right? So if I am a... Most NPCs have a, uh, a base walking speed of 30 feet, which means that most, uh, in this case, have that same uh, speed. So if I uh, use my move to move 30 feet, and then uh, I, as the commander, rolled a successful uh, strength check against this DC, then every single person in that unit would then get a plus one damage for every five members of that unit. That's awesome. Yeah, that does cap out at plus 20 damage for the attack, uh, because you can't have a unit with more than 100 individuals that's true yep and it does deal half the uh damage you deal to the defending army back on your own army that is the problem is that you you sort of charge it's like you see those um 
uh, like, you know, 300 or some of those Grecian army movies where like they run just headlong shields up spears up into the uh into the opposing foe and like they just get some of them get clocked hardcore um and this bonus damage can only be done during this turn i love that uh another action is fall back uh you command your army to uh to to uh double your speed um which is literally not like taking the dash action. You just make their speed go, um, you know, twice as far as if they would just normally take a take a running action. But they have to roll a dexterity or strength check against a DC of fifteen. I love it. Run away! Yeah. I like that it's acrobatics or athletics. Yeah, exactly. Um. Uh, inspire troops, uh, persuasion, charisma mm-hmm. against DC sixteen. This is this is still uh, you know relatively uh, normalized DC sixteen, DC fifteen. Um, if successful, a unit you command gets advantage on their next attack roll. So in this case, let's say I, as the commander of the unit, I want to inspire my troops before they attack. I roll my charisma persuasion check. It's successful. My unit attacks. They have advantage. If they already had advantage, probably from something else, like a feat or something like that, then they would get plus two as well as advantage on that roll. That's yeah. awesome. My players liked that one a lot. In the scenario I ran. How inspiring can you be? Uh, this bonus to hit can only be used during this turn. Fair. It ends at the end of the turn. Evaluate positioning. So you roll an intelligence check. Um, any any um any any specific skill check or just bare bones intelligence for an evaluate positioning? Uh, just bare bones. Cool beats. Um, yeah, I like that. If successful, a unit you command can at the end of their turn re-roll their initiative with an extra bonus equal to your intelligence modder modifier for the next round. That's cool. So instead of like, oh man, I got a four. Okay, well, well, let's when it comes to our turn, we'll do evaluate positioning and let's re-roll and hopefully we'll get better than a four this turn. Or next turn. Only keeps their new initiative if it's higher than their current one. Oh, that's good. That's nice. That's so nice. They could re-roll it again at two, and you would be like, uh shit. Sometimes that's what you want, though. <laughs> that's true. You want to wait for the other person to make the first move. Oh. Yeah, it, I I only actually did uh, it because uh, then you wouldn't have two turns in a in a round. Yeah, yeah, uh, two turns <laughs> in a round. Oh man, ooh, yeah, and writing I extra mean... rules to negate that would be cumbersome. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a a thing that happens in aliens pretty frequently. That's true. The aliens, because they're so fast, they get two initiative positions within the turn order. Well, not only that, but uh, I forget which character, but somebody has the ability to swap initiative. That's correct. That's correct. That gives them a chance to move twice on a a single turn. That is true. Okay. Okay. Let's go with the last one, which is called Scare Tactics. This is one of my favorites. I'm going to be honest. Choose one unit within 90 feet. So other than the... I'm assuming this means other than the unit that you're already in as a commander. Uh, Roll Charisma or Strength Intimidation. Uh, Again, I love the fact that you're using either one of those ability scores. Against a DC, which is equal to the target's hit points. Oh, Holy shit. <laughs> so don't do this against enormous mobs of monsters where the target hit point target hit points are like, you know, 75. Uh, good luck trying to scare them. You got to whittle them down and then you scare the shit out of them. Um, if successful, the target must use its turn to move as far away as they can from your unit. Does not affect units who are immune to the frightened condition. That's yeah, great. We we ran into trouble with that one right away because one of the, my players was like, cool, I'm going to have my whole unit run in and just be like, ah, and scare these cowardly demons. And we're like, cool, the target's 60? Oof, good luck with that, DC. Yeah, I, I made you some 
epic heroes to play, but uh, yeah, no. Yeah. Did he read the rules? <laughs> Maybe that, not that last one. Oh, well. Cool. All right. So then uh, let's move on to combat. So we've talked about combat pretty much ad nauseum, but I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, when you start, you roll initiative uh, based on the unit's initiative modifier. So you just don't, you don't have to roll. If there's 10 units, you don't have to roll for every single person in the unit. You roll for the unit's initiative and you roll for the opposing unit's initiative. Now I have a question. Let's say, this is, this is a question for you, Jesper. If you have three units of the same type, Let's say I have three units of, again, 10 flumps. Can I roll one single initiative for all three, or do I have to roll individually the initiative for all three of those units? It's kind of whatever. Okay. I mean, you, you can, you can, that, that's just up to the DM. Cool um, beats. I love that. It's uh, if, you, if you have like a lot of units to roll initiative for, from, it's much easier to just... Roll one. Roll ones. Okay. Yeah, a lot easier to manage. I agree. Yeah, it turns the, the units into something of a regiment, all mm -hmm. acting in unison. Yep. Mm -hmm. I imagine, like, something out of, like, you know, like the Patriot, where, like, everybody's, like, marching at the same time. It's like... Yeah. I could see separate um, initiatives if, you know, our barbarian with their helm of telepathy and three flump units also had a unit of like drow rangers way over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Down for that. Um, okay. When a unit, like we're talking about in the beginning, when a unit takes enough damage to go over the threshold to get reduced in size, we talked about the size thresholds at the beginning, then the person controlling the unit, and this is important on maps, not so much necessarily on theater of the mind, but the person controlling the unit decides which square the unit, when you reduce it from a four by four to a one by one square, which square the unit ends up in. That actually can make a lot of tactical um, choice Op, well, a lot, a lot of uh, tactical options, right? If you choose which square the, um, you know, the unit is going to be reduced in size to, you can determine a lot of uh, of playability for like, okay, well, now that that unit is a is a fifteen by fifteen square rather than a thirty by thirty square, that means that this they're no longer in melee range of the unit that they were just fighting. Pretty cool. Now I can just run, or I can go around, or I can move to someplace else. Um, if the unit also gives them the option to, if they have uh, a choke point, yes, they can funnel back and they can still hold against a, a larger unit because the larger unit can't fit in with them as easily. Well, that's the interesting thing. We're going to get onto it a little bit later, but um, units don't necessarily have to be square. They can be rectangular. They can have different shapes that you can um, amalgam them to. Uh, but we'll get into that uh, in in the uh, in the rules at the at the tail end of of our discussion. Uh, when a unit is reduced to zero hit points, you got. There's no death saving throws for units. Sorry. If the unit had a commander, as it says here, the commander's the only one left. <laughs> I love that. He's like the only guy standing like everyone's dead. He's like, uh, shit. He had all these ninjas. Yeah. What happened to my flump ninjas? <laughs> and that makes it great for a narrative standpoint. Like when your BBEG commander is the last one standing on the field very visibly regretting his decisions. Yep. It, it makes for a satisfying scene. I love it. I love it a lot. Um, I guess at that point, once the commander is the last one standing here, um, if the unit took up more than one square, the commander can choose which square to end up on. Perfect. So now the commander, technically, although he's not taking up 15 by 15 feet, that commander token is then placed on the map to represent where the commander is. Um, if a unit survives a battle, the downed individuals of the unit survive if they can get medical attention. I love this so much. 
I love it. It's not like, you know, like, oh, well, we couldn't save all of Regiment 45. We're just going to have to deal with them being at five strength instead of 25 strength. No, they can come back to their main uh, uh, strength, what they were at with the beginning of the battle. If you can give them medical attention, it takes one week and they regenerate back to their original size. Um, or you can just say that if, you know, medical attention was not possible because how would you give medical attention to a, uh, to a black pudding? Um, well, then you could just say, you know, black puddings were regenerated by the magical hoo-ha of your, of your necromancing grandma. Somebody slashed it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, they, they turn, yeah. <laughs> someone, someone cut that black pudding in two. Yes, sir. Chunk. Now we have four, four black puddings, sir. Exactly. All right. So that's you, we can, you can essentially recruit that way. You can recruit new units by just chopping black puddings in half. Um. Yeah. There. Uh. The question I have then is: Let's assume that the unit has been destroyed. That this was a unit that was commanded by a specific commander. My question now to J. Uh. To sorry to to Jasper is. Now that the commander is no longer attached to that unit, can that commander, let's say he or she or they were a PC, would they be able to take the actions that they had before they were commanding a unit, a.k.a. casting spells and doing crazy warrior shit? Yeah. Solid. <laughs> As long, because they're not the commander anymore, so they, they just... Yeah. Become they, themselves again. <laughs> yeah, they, you go to the, the right column of that page where it's PCs who act on their own. Aha! Well done, Segway Master. Um, PCs who act on their own. If a PC wants to act on its own on the battlefield, there are a few extra rules. This is where things get really messed up, and I love it, and yet I fear it so much. Here we go. Single target damage that they deal to any unit is divided by 10, rounded up to the nearest whole number. So, in other words, if I am a PC and I disband from my unit because I want to be all Mr. Cool, I'm going to throw a fireball because I'm not commanding anyone. I'm going to throw a fireball at that unit of flumps. And boom, I throw out 42 fire damage. No, you don't. You actually uh, 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 only do five. Sorry, five. yes, you do. Uh, actually, yeah. Um... <laughs> AOE spells are different. Oh, damn. This is single I didn't target damage. Oh, so like single I shoot target, a... target is divided by 10 because that's how you got the uh, HP, the IHP. That's right. Of the unit. Right. Uh, individuals. I missed where it said, uh, oh, there's a damaging area of effect spells are the only source of damage that's not reflected by the reduction. My bad. I need to read better. Um, so let's say like, I don't know, that uh, NPC is a, is a rogue. Um, and they shoot their bow and they crit and they do 85 damage because they're like a level 14 rogue and uh, sneak attack, right? Uh, no, you only do nine damage. Is that is that right? Yes, and in this case, that's enough to take out one of the six HP veterans we were talking about previously and wound another. So. Hell yeah. So like your arrow goes through one and into another. <laughs> that's amazing. You killed Jim and sort of killed Bob. It's fine. I'm down for it. And yeah, you're right. The um, the damaging area of effect spells. So you can fireball the shit out of uh, units and do some some serious damage. I love that. Yeah, if, if the unit fits within the area of effect, it takes full damage. If the area of effect is not large enough to cover the entire unit, they take half damage. Okay. So, for example, let's say a cone of cold. Excuse me, cone of cold. Cone of colds go out like this, obviously. Um, so, if you are in that unit and you're face to face with a unit, the I believe that the maximum distance the cone of cold goes out to is sixty feet, if I remember correctly. So that means it yep. goes five, fifteen. Uh, so, in a in a fifteen by fifteen square, that is one, two three, four squares. So we would go out 15 feet. So we would sort of like make a triangle through the, through a 15 by 15 unit. Yeah. Right. Am I, am I doing this right? 
triangle, right? Yeah. Through, it, through, it, through a 15 by 15, because it goes 5, 10, 15. It would make a triangle through that, that. So it wouldn't cover the whole unit, correct? You'd have to sort of like go back a bit to get the full spread of a cone of cold, yes. right? Yeah. That makes much more sense. I like that. So it's like, you know, those like, uh, there's some video game um, uh, simulators, like the the massive battle simulators. Jesper, did you ever see those? Those massive battle simulators on computer? Massive battle simulators? You've never no. seen massive battle simulators? Uh, go on YouTube, type in massive battle simulator, and they have like 30,000 orcs versus 30,000 Spartans and shit like that, and they just hit play, and it just it smooshes them all together and then you can fast forward through it or you can rewind through it, or you can like zoom in it's like total war rome or something like that basically and it shows how absolutely devastating certain units attacks are to just um you know your average mook on the army on the battlefield so like you'll have an army of um roman soldiers with with gladii versus like modern soldiers with bazookas and flamethrowers and you see how these explosions just tear through a whole bunch of these poor uh ancient romans uh, and flamethrowers i mean don't even ask but it is absolutely just mind-blowing to see how area of effect weapons can do that kind of damage widespread on these kind of battlefields uh, yeah epic ragdoll battle simulator thank you, you uh, epic battle simulator the uh ragdoll physics remind you of the first time you saw ragdoll physics as a kid they're just a delight to watch i think i know what you're talking about though <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty dope um that's it um yeah that is the system you can play it like this very easily with no hassle sold right Vendu, as they say. Um, there are ways to make this system deeper. Shall we go deeper? Yes. Okay. Let's take a break. Let's take a five-minute break. And when we come back, we will be going deeper, uh, in Inception style, um, into, this particular, um, into this particular supplement. So don't go anywhere. We'll be back in five minutes. We'll see you in a bit. Don't move, damn it. I said, don't move, don't you move. I see you moving, don't move.
Um, this is where things get fun. Not that they weren't before, but things get even more fun now because you get to you get to sort of play with the rules a little bit and make them you know cool for for whatever you want to do with your group. Um, so let's say you wanted to have um, units on mounts. Well, you can include your mounts as part of the unit um, by incorporating whatever mount it is that you uh, have, but you have to make sure uh, of a couple things. Number one, that the unit that is mounting the unit is one size smaller than the mount itself, right? So you can't have like, uh, yeah, they're mounted, um, it's, it's uh, dwarves mounted on orcs. Um, that makes for a very weird uh, fever dream, but not so much with, uh, with the whole idea of how that's going to help you within a giant battle. So like, okay, let's just take the average uh, here example, which is we take our, our veteran and we put them on the mount that everyone chooses to use, camels, right? Camels are the best. We know them. We love them. They carry water. They spit. We're happy with them. U.S. military has camels. Uh, I'm not. I'm not poo-pooing camels. Uh, I mean, Conan hit a camel in the face, and look what happened to him. He became governor of California. So yeah, um, you just gotta put in their AC uh, of the mount that uh, you are mounting. Wow, I am really awesome tonight with words. Um, when adding mounts to a unit, you add your unit and the mount's AC together and then divide it by two. That is the new AC uh, of that unit of mounted whatevers. You take the hit points of that mount and divide that number by 10, round it up, and multiply that number with how many are in the unit and add it to the maximum hit points of that unit. Oh, Matt, I'm so bad at math. Why are you telling me all this stuff? Just fucking show me what you mean. Okay, fine, I will. I don't know why I just sounded like Barney from The Simpsons, but that's okay. We're all going to go this, through this together. Example, we now have a veteran unit and we want to make him a mounted veteran unit. Well, we got these camels and they ain't doing shit. So we're going to throw these veterans on camels. Um, the AC of the veterans is 17, and the AC of a camel is 9. Add them together, and divide by 2, divide by 2, and round up, and you get 13. That's the AC of the mounted veterans on camels. Then you take the camel's hit points, and you divide them by 10, and you add them to... Sorry, they have 15 hit points, divide by 10 is 1.5, you round up to 2. Okay. Multiply by 25, because you got 25 veterans, you got 25 camels. Add that to the unit's hit points, which were before 150, and add the 50 of the camels to the veterans. And how many hit points do we have? Children. Anyone? You now have 200. Thank you. Thank you. I was about to say Bueller and JFC. I really like the way this system works. Me too. Because an easy way to write this, if you're trying to write a formula for doing it, is you can take the IHP of the monster type or the creature type you want to be the rider, and you can take the IHP of the mount and use it as a modifier. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true, you can. X plus Y multiplied by the number in, of creatures in the unit gives you your total IHP. My nose almost began to bleed there for a second there, JF. I'm just saying, you know, started to say X plus Y. I'm like, what are you doing? Stop. I, I am not going into sine waves. My God. Ugh, someone get me an ad bill. It's fine. It's fine. We all do math. Math is not our enemy. Math is our friend. We're happy with math. Just don't go near calculus. It will kill you. Um, okay. Now, camels are not a medium-sized creature. They are a large-sized creature. That's why you can mount them. And because they are large and you now have a mounted unit... They have gone from a unit of 25 um, uh, unmounted cavalry, which was a 30 by 30 unit, and added their enormous girth to making it a 60 by 60 unit, or four squares large on a 15 by 15 grid. 
not bad. That's a lot of, that's a lot of camels. 25 camels. It's about right. If you think of it, like, how large is a camel in real life? It's like 10 feet. Right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'd say, depending on the camel, like, 8 by 4 by 7-ish. Yeah, so if I have, like, a 5 by 5 grid of camels, if I have 25 camels, that's about 60 feet. Depending on how off, you know how far apart you space them, like you don't want to go ass to mouth with camels. It's just bad. You just don't want to do it. It's gross. Okay, sorry. I just love making JF crack up. Okay, here we go. Let's keep going. This is the cool ass shit number two. Reliability. How reliable are your army units? Honestly, um, I think that it means and. Um, what I, what I want to be sure I understand here, uh, Jesper is the, how, how good they are as a unit, right? How, how many battles they've seen, how much, uh, how, how much, how much shit they've seen in their, in their experience as a unit, um, which makes them better at what they do. Correct. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of, um, it's kind of like morale. Um, oh, neat. In a way. Okay. So, so it uh, and it's calculated by the IHP. Um, so uh, that's kind of how that that's their experience in mm -hmm. battle, uh, like the IHP is. Because I mean, a veteran much higher IHP than a kind of like a guard. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so this is kind of a morality system, no, or not morality, like moral morale system. system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. because they can stay on the battlefield even though they take a large amount of damage, for example, or something. Like that. Cool, neat. I like it. Uh, you take the IHP plus the unit's proficiency bonus. So, in this case, the proficiency bonus of so a, the veteran is two. Is two to get their reliability and. You don't know what that does, but reliability is a sort of modifier to certain things. Like, for example, something called readiness. Readiness is at the top of each battle before you roll the initiative. You roll readiness for each unit led by a commander. And that is a d20 plus the reliability that we just calculated. Plus the proficiency bonus of a commander and you roll that against a DC of a very, very high number, 25. If you are successful with this readiness check, the units, I'm assuming like, because you can have commanders that uh, are in charge of multiple units, correct? So as you said, so if successful, the units, not the unit, can double the temporary hit points that their commander provides. Or actually, no, that wouldn't be right. It would be the only, it would be the only the unit that the commander is in, because he provides the temporary hit points, right? Or she provides those so, temporary hit points, right? Yes and no, from what I can see, because of that ability to control more than one unit, you can go between the units. If a commander leaves one unit like direct command, yep. you can assume another unit in that three he's commanding and grant them those HP. Okay. But I don't think this readiness role with the commander's proficiency bonus would apply to the no. new unit you're joining. Yeah, because readiness is only is only at the top of the battle. Because it can only be done once. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the commander being able to switch between units is something... Uh, we missed a little bit earlier. Right. That's true. Sorry. I missed it. Is that the one that you wanted to go back to? Yeah, it was... Let's go back. Uh, That's cool. That's kind of cool. three. It was under commanders. Okay. It was just a mention that they could leave the unit and act independently, and they can rejoin another unit after that. Oh, um, yeah. That the commander is the last one standing thing. If they're the last one standing, they can go join the unit. I think... I think they would use their current HP to calculate the temporary IHP they give to the unit. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't get the bonuses that you get at the, the start of battle. Makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. 
Jesper, any comments on that one? No. Okay. Cool. You got it right, Jay. I'm, uh, I'm uh, doing notes. <laughs> oh no! This is hey. If there's anything that that uh, we can provide you, it, it is uh, a ridiculous uh, amount of, of feedback and or notes. Perfect. I enjoy breaking mechanics. This is why I invite the guy to the show. Just letting you know. Chris, you have your work cut out for you. I'm just being perfectly mm -hmm. frank. Okay, let's head on back to extended rules. So we've got our reliability system. We've got our readiness. I like this. This is neat. These are extended rules. And I guess the question I have for you, Jesper, is are these... Um, these are optional rules, correct? Like reliability doesn't seem to have to be uh, mandatory, nor does readiness, correct? Like these are optional. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I I talk about that in the introduction too. That you can add and subtract rules as you want. Love uh, it. The the basic rules are everything that's needed mm -hmm. to make the system work, and then you can just add on stuff if you want to. Dope. I love it. Uh, overwhelming damage when a unit loses over half their maximum hit points on a single turn. Whew, it sucks. Uh, D20 plus your reliability plus your commander's proficiency bonus against a DC of 20. Okay, that's good. Um, and yeah, this is a uh, this is an attrition test, essentially, like in Warhammer 40k, essentially. On a failure, the unit immediately disbands and flees for their lives. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's not like they, you know, have a few people scatter. Like, everybody's just like, that's GTFO. This isn't worth it. You remove the unit from the battlefield. I have battle noticed fields. one thing about these DCs is they seem higher than they are in practice. Um, yep. Using the example of our, our veteran with the reliability would be eight. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a fifth level commander, they have a proficiency bonus of three. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're making a roll against a DC 20 with a plus 11. So, so you it's can more roll than a 50% chance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, which which does make it easier for units to hold cohesion through this. Yeah, but it. But a veteran is a pretty high CR as well, right? That's why they're going to have that high reliability because their hit points are so high. It's all based around hit points, it seems. Yeah, I mean they're CR three as an individual in five E. Mm -hmm. So they're about equivalent to a. Okay. A single fifth level character, they have a two attack thing. Yep. Which the units get multiple attacks too. Yep, they do indeed. So, the next one overwhelming might. When a unit kills an enemy unit or deals more damage than half their enemy's maximum hit points, the attacking unit gets a bonus equal to their reliability on their next attack roll they make. Oh, damn. Chris, did your did your folks use these these rules? No, uh, because we we're just trying to keep it fast and dirty. And the surprise for doing mass combat, it really had to pare it down. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Um, if you were to take any one of these optional rules that we've been going through so far, which one would you take on the next time you try it? I do like the idea of reliability overall, mm -hmm. um, but it is something that more for like a longer term battle, like you're going to do a kingdom management run. Yes, army. yes, yes, yes. I agree. Uh, cool. Um, yeah. Nice. Um, we talked a little bit sort of in a joking fashion about recruiting black puddings, but here you can, in fact, recruit your units uh, by conscripting NPCs. Um, and they have salaries. You gotta pay these mofos. What the hell? Son of a... IHP times two silver per day. The GM provides a pool of NPCs that can be recruited in this way with a limited supply. Now, I'm, I am smelling, uh, all of the total war games coming out through the pores of this particular system in a big way. You a big fan of Total War there, Jesper? I've never played Total War or what? Warhammer. <laughs> we need to fix that. What <laughs> the mother? Wow. Okay. No. Are you a fan of uh, of war gaming? I should have asked you that at the start. 
No. <laughs> I know it's weird. Are you RTS games? No, not really. I mean, it's, it's, it's weird. I, I made this system because I wanted a super easy system to use when uh, we ran uh, Rime of the Frostmaiden for uh, when a bunch of things attacked uh, one of the towns. Ladies and gentlemen, but, he's a map maker. He's a creator of game mechanics. Watsy, what's wrong with you? Why are you not hiring this guy? Yeah, tell them. Tell them. Because they watch this channel. <laughs> yeah, of course they do. Fuck, I just I have a Dungeons and Dragons blurred out coffee mug. That, that's the reason why they watch this channel. All right. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm totally gobsmacked the fact that you've, you, you don't like uh, play a bazillion uh, RTS games or even like massive army games or anything like that. And yet this system is just, Mwah. It lines up with them so well. It's great. The the conscription and the, the process for hiring mercenaries is so similar to the Total War stuff that mm -hmm. I am flabbergasted that you have not played these to keep, include this kind of upkeep <laughs> mechanic. And it's uh, it's weird. It's <laughs> but it's, it lines up. Coming, it's coming through your Swedish genes. I just I think it's just in general. Yeah, uh, we're known for our. Wars and conscripting. <laughs> yeah. You like warmongering Swedes. Uh, mm. <laughs> yep. Ikea was the have... first step. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you guys did have most of Northern Europe at one point. I've seen yeah, that did. map that they have in the uh, yes. the Stockholm War Museum. Yeah. Okay. It was a very long time ago, though. <laughs> okay, okay. So we're going to leave the past in the past. We're not going to bring it into the present. It's fine. See, he's, he does not speak for his people. <laughs> <clears throat> Although they're all awesome. Okay, let's move on quickly. Now, this is kind of cool. This is some additional stuff. You can actually do like siege warfare with like barricades and walls and siege equipment and stuff like that. That's neat. When I was a kid, they had this thing called castles and catapults. I don't know if there's anybody remembers that who's my age, but they basically, you, 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 you know that one, JF? Remember castles and catapults? Oh my God. Okay. It was a toy line where they literally made like castles out of plastic and you make your catapult and you'd like position it far away and you'd launch rocks. Some people would actually put real rocks and aim them at you instead of your castle. Paul Saratella. Um, and... It, 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 I have it, a brother that's a decade older than me. I'm feeling this so hard. <laughs> let me tell you, I loved that game, except when he hit me one time and the play date was over. Um, but it was it was essentially like that. Like you have armies and fucking siege equipment. Like that was dope. Why don't they have that in Dungeons and Dragons? It's not castles and catapults. It's Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, I get it. Because of the C and C and the D and the D. I get it. Okay, fine. Be that way. Yeah, and if you're going with C and C, people are going to get confused about what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I 100% understand that one. But yeah, I love the rules here for barricades and walls and how they can sort of impede movement, uh, cause some uh, some issues here with your, uh, with your overall sort of army placement. So really neat. I like that a lot. This whole section is a great way to get your party into the narrative is to let them go ham with these rules on a place that they're trying to defend. Mm hmm. I like that. And I like the fact that you have like different materials have different ACs um, and a, a set amount of hit points so that you have to like send the right kinds of units against those particular types of uh, of barricades or defenses in order to do the damage that you need to them. They have something similar to that. Um, what's it called in D&D? It's called like siege damage or something like that. Um, uh, a Tarasks yeah, yeah. have it. Yeah, uh, a lot of the siege ships weapons. have it too. Yeah. I mean, um, this this part of the, the booklet, uh, a lot of it is just... Um, it's a, like a commentary on on what uh, the rules are in the DMG. Um, I'm not 
saying that it is because I can't if I want to release this uh, in OGL. Right. And the rules for the materials are are they changed. They exist. They're out there. Yeah, but they, I've changed the ACs and stuff because yeah, um, legally distinct. I didn't like it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I did, <laughs> and I didn't like like how they did that. Um, way. my favorite sentence in this entire page is a unit of wolves might not be the best trebuchet controllers. Yeah. <laughs> they might make for good ammunition, though. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I'm, know. I'm, I would want to try and wrangle an angry wolf into the bucket of a trebuchet and be like, now stay there! And run. <laughs> I mean, I've that, tried that to was... wrangle Stranger Things in d and <laughs> I've, I've actually I've, I've done some research into like medieval battles and stuff just because of this section. And the, like using cows and stuff as ammunition oh is my actually God. a thing. Yeah. Um, what? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they did a lot of damage uh, when they hit something, and they died, of course, if they weren't already dead. And they could make, uh, like, they could spread diseases in the, in the castle. That's true. So, yeah. yeah, and that kind of thing is the one thing I don't see in this section about sieges, is, like, long-term siege, what kind of attrition they take when they yeah. go on half rations, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, chances for disease outbreaks, if something gets into a well. Veris verif is it, wait, let me see if I can say it right way. Verisimilitude. There, there we go. Uh, yeah. Doesn't necessarily make for the most um, uh, enthralling roleplay. <laughs> no, it doesn't, but at the same time, being on the inside of that siege, that could provide a lot of really hard roleplay decisions for characters who are mm. trying to figure out how to keep a town running and keep a force up to guard against the siege while their conditions are deteriorating. Yeah, very well said. Okay, so it's time to also we can talk about a little bit uh, about improving units um, and earning enhancement points. Now, in about uh, probably like five, ten minutes after we go through some of this stuff, we're going to do a little bit of a, uh, of a skirmish uh, between Chris and JF here. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in the break. They're going to choose using the enhancement points as their currency. Uh, I've given them six enhancement points apiece to do with what they will. And those will be uh, the uh, the the the. A, a way for them to make their armies that they've chosen um, even cooler and even better than they were when you just sort of chose random uh, NPCs from the monster manual. Um, because when you spend enhancement points, as we talked a little bit about at the beginning, you can do all kinds of stuff with your particular NPCs. You can make them, as it says here, have better ability score improvements or better armor proficiency or give them a theme. What? A theme? What the hell is a theme? Or give them better equipment. Well, as it says here, well said. Whoop. A theme is like an extra layer that you put on your unit. It gives the unit extra features and actions and might also change their stats. <laughs> what? So there's lots of different types of themes. I'm not going to go through them all because they're all amazing and they're all so well done. But so we can have um, a flump who is a a deathless flump or a berserker flump these are just the martial themes by the way a protector flump a, a multi-attack flump a sniper flump oh my god i think that's my new band name sniper flump um then there's other ones like arcane themes so we're going to use magic now so we can infuse these particular units with a little bit of uh, arcane flavor make them uh abjurers or diviners or evokers or illusionists they're just it's just the outside shell on a delicious uh, uh vanilla ice cream uh, uh that we're all eating here right illusionists necromancer this one's cool it only costs you one enhancement point you get to add one necromancy spell to that unit spell slots and they get death puppets. Once a day, the Necromancer unit may resurrect one dead unit as a zombie unit. It's everything I've ever wanted in my life. I get a zombie unit that dies. Uh, the Sir, we're, lo we're losing archers on the left flank. 
it's fine. We've got we've got the necromancers close by. <laughs> yes. It should be noted that you can't add some of these themes to any unit. Correct. Um, the arcane themes you have to have units that are casters. Yeah. Right. Uh, the martial themes seem to be a little bit more easy. The beast themes apply to a, an entirely different class of uh, NPCs than the average player is used to running. Neat. I love it. Um, I like this one here for the transmuter. As an action, the transmuter unit may spend a spell slot, any spell slot, to make a 30 by 15 foot area within 15 feet impassable by any ground unit. Holy crap. That's neat. That's like basically like making a giant wall of stone in front of you. Or like in any way, like you could make it like into like lava or mud or whatever it is, right? Oh no, it, it blocks vision. So it's got to be like a giant like stone wall, essentially. Stone wall or an earthen burn. Yeah, that's neat. I like that. Impassable by any ground unit. Wow. Well, we haven't talked about flying units. I mean, there are flying units. Flying units can sort of change your Z-axis on these kinds of massive battles. But uh, essentially, we're going to keep on keeping on divine themes. So these are the clerical units. Paths uh, with divine command. I love that. Path of peace. Path of water. They can use their bonus action to call forth a wave of water on one unit of their choice. Tarkimus makes the same throw, and then they get the entire unit gets not thrown. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, wow. Okay. And then other themes like specialist themes, they must be taken by humanoid units. Climbers, cooks, dancers, doctors, alchemists, sappers. What? Uh, that's going to be changed. Uh, they're gonna, any unit can take the specialist themes out, as long as it makes sense. Hooray. I finally get to fulfill my wish of uh, sapper goblins that I've had in pretty much every Warcraft game known to man. See, uh, I, I see the sapper and hearing that anything that it makes sense. Giant eagles are very intelligent. Yeah, they're 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 the thing is, what is it? Oh, they they use their action to throw bombs that damage any unit within the thirty foot by thirty foot area within forty five feet. Dexterity save. I am save. so down for a squadron flyby. <laughs> 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 On a fa oh, this is bad though. On a failure, if they uh, the units, yeah, if the well, if they may, they make a dex save. On a failure, they take an amount of six sided dice equal to the sapper's IHP. Holy shit, dude. Wow. Has that been playtested? It's not that much. I mean, if you, um, if you check, uh, like, the IHP is not much. Wait, an yeah. amount of six-sided dice equal yeah. to the sapper's IHP. So, for if example... Compared, if you made veteran sappers, yeah, it would be 6d6. Yeah. Oh, oh to each. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking about the total of the unit rather than the individual IHP of yeah. the members of the unit. So it would be a, a DC 16. Yep. Uh, versus 66 double damage against structures. That's and actually not too bad. Three times per battle, which is similar to the three times per long rest mm -hmm. that you see on a lot of the abilities on fifth level player characters in 5e. That's dope. That's really great. You also have to remember that units has a lot of hit points in this system. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, we will definitely yeah. see that in a, a very short period of time. Uh, spell wreckers. Spell wreckers. While the unit hits another unit it's concentrating on a spell, that unit makes their concentration check with disadvantage. Ugh! Jeez. Throw the spell wreckers against the abjurers. Um, Wit. This unit gains the Vicious Mockery Cantrip. Yep. Disadvantage on all attacks they make during the next turn. Dope. Beast themes. Beast units. So we have Armored Beasts. Loyal Beasts. Indomitable. These are all amazing. I'm definitely going to do like a really concentrated like look into each one. But I saw none of them that I would be like, that's broken. Or that's wrong. 
this is perfect for a summoner druid. That's true. That lets you use these rules to use their summons as a unit. Yeah. That's nice. I like that. Summon swarms of... Wait, can you summon swarms? You can't summon... I can't remember if you can summon swarms. You can summon... Uh, there are some swarms, but there's also the, the silly things like summon insect plague and then polymorph creatures where you can turn right things into a lot of things. Mm. Yeah. Or even uh, summon uh, woodland being. Oh, right. But you don't get to choose you know, the woodland beings, right? G uh, the DM needs it, to pick those. It depends. It, it, that's a a dm choice kind of mm -hmm, thing mm -hmm. uh but like that gives you a unit of eight giant owls or because it's based off of uh your cr how many you summon right the lower your cr the larger it is the more it makes sense to turn that summon into a unit now here's the kind of cool thing if you want to just flavor your units with what jesper here says are called negative themes I love that because it gives, it obviously gives a detrimental effect to that unit, but honestly, I just love the flavor. Like to have a packed, uh, a panicked goblin sapper unit. Like imagine it for a second, like 30 goblin sappers that have bombs and they're just get panicked. Like they're like, ah, da, 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 da. so when they, they must roll the reliability roll for overwhelming damage every time it's their turn. <laughs> that's that's crazy they're just like ah i can't take it and they just run with their bombs every time and even something as simple as taking the example we've been using of the veteran and applying the aged negative trait to i it, love that it gives you your boys holding up in helm's deep kind of thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's very cool All right. And, you know, make them reckless at the same time, because what do they have to lose at that point? <laughs> uh, gives a couple of tips here for balancing battles. Uh, for each three enhancement points spent on a unit, increase the CR of the unit by one step. I like that. Uh, in case you're wondering about CRs, anyway. If the damage is above the threshold that makes the unit do four times damage, the unit XP value doubles. If you're using XP, God help you. But if you, uh, if you know, if you want to do that, it's your choice. You know, no one's going to judge you. Um, it's just a part of how you balance battles in in D and D. Yeah, it's a dumb part. I don't like how balancing is made in D and D, but there's no better way for me. I guess so, right? Because you yeah, have to balance it with some kind points. of of Balance mechanic a little better than uh, the yeah. challenge rating overall yeah yeah just because the larger values so you can fine-tune them a little bit better than something that goes from one quarter or one eighth to 20. Mm, fair yeah uh some terminology uh that's sort of a glossary here which is great and then we're into our final section here and i'm not gonna actually uh go through these because first of all they're all amazing and they are specifically for um uh, uh commanders so once you become a commander you lose obviously all your actions but you gain all these amazing battle feats or at least the access to them depending on your level of your particular commander so for um for fighters they get more than other classes or at least access to, uh, to additional uh, battle feats. Uh, Fidel's get him at 5th, 8th, 11th, 14th, 17th, and 20th. And other classes get them at 5th, 9th, 13th, and 17th. Um, Jesper recommends that if you're going to do this, give the PC that wants to be the particular commander of an army, or maybe all of your PCs in your campaign, give them access to one of these battle feats at the, stop, at, at the start of your campaign. Because it's not going to really do much until they get into a massive army fight. Um, but as they progress and as their armies get cooler and cooler, they get more battle feats. Um, feats are 
uh, attributed to certain classes. And then there are these ones, which are called classless feats, which are ones that you can put on any class, uh, such as against all odds, when you, uh, when you, and unit you command is subjected to overwhelming damage, which we talked about before, then your unit instantly regains a number of hit points equal to the level and the unit's reliability. Um, some require certain proficiencies uh, in tools or in instruments uh, or in certain levels and or proficiencies in skills. And um, sorry, there's a fly buzzing around. It's wintertime, fly. Where aren't you dead? The fuck? Jesus. I found an earthworm in the snow the other day. I'm, I, I take no comfort knowing how messed up our climate is right now. It's weird. Like, why is there a fly here? It's it's freezing outside. Maybe that's why it's inside. I get it. That's fine. I'll allow you to live. Um, But yeah, feats. Feats, feats, feats. So cool. Love them. Uh, more uh, uh, skill tree appropriation for commanders. I love that. Um, and then, of course, class feats, feats that only certain classes can take, like barbarian feats, bard feats, cleric feats, druid feats, bard... Oh, wait. Did you say bard feats? Did you say... Oh, bar... sorry. I just didn't go scroll up. Fighter feats, do 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 monk, paladin, ranger, rogue, sorcerer, warlock, wizard. <gasps> no artificer feats? Uh-oh. They were moved. <laughs> <laughs> um, can't use them in the OGL. So, um, oh, that's right, because they're not part yeah. of. Oh my god! Uh, I will. I will release. Um, I have written three artificer feats, and they will be released uh, separately. That's completely fair. Three. That's right. In our campaign in Ravenloft, we're doing. We're we're completely going against standard OGL with a blood hunter and an artificer, and I mean. It is what it is, but yeah, awesome. These feats are amazing. Okay. There are, towards the end here, because I want to wrap this up because I want to have these two fight each other. Let them fight. Um, modified rules. Changing rules around, like we talked about, like you don't have to have square uh, uh, unit sizes. You can have them rectangular. Um, so if you want to really sort of move things uh, to like, uh, changing the, the 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 shape of the actual uh, units, they can uh, be seen here on this table here. So if you have a fifteen by fifteen unit, you can change it to be a rectangle of thirty by fifteen, all the way up to one hundred and thirty five by one hundred and thirty five, which changes them into a rectangle of one sixty five by one hundred five feet. Um, that's great. I love that because oftentimes we don't see armies uh, uh, units in squares. We see them in rectangles, and then they sort of, you know, they move. Uh, accordingly it really reminds me of the deployment phase in the total war games yep yeah it lets you click and drag drag them space into and, lines and rectangles and stuff that's neat. yeah it lets you set up layered formations roger that i love that um damage normally uh right we're talking one to 50 double damage 50 to 100 quadruple damage but if you want to get spicy, you can go even harder by using this attacker defender chart to determine how much damage and how well you can scale depending on how many individuals are in an attacking unit versus the defending unit. And as you say here, Jesper, I love the fact that this may feel actually relatively realistic depending on who hits first. So if you have an attacker that's like, I don't know, let's let's go with our our uh, camel uh, mounted veterans. We have 25 of them, um, which would be attacking. Well, that's this this column here. Uh, they would do against a unit that is the defender, which is in this uh, column here of, again, 25 potentially, I don't know, maybe flumps. Um, that would do double damage. But if, an, uh, if that same veteran unit of 25 mounted camel veterans went up against a unit of... Um, well, actually, that's just double all the way down. Let's say if you have a unit of... Uh, let's say they were defending against 75 flumps, right? 75 flumps come at them, boom, 
75 flumps would do against that unit of uh, 25 mounted veterans. They would do six times the damage. Times six of the standard attack. That's cool. I love that. Go get him, Flumps. That um, is the advantage of numbers right there. I love it. Uh, big battles, mainly melee attacks. You may want to keep the unit. You want to waive the unit limitation of 100 individuals per unit, but keep the way the system does the hit point calculation. Melee unit with 1,500 hit points. Oh, sorry. I just got to take a break here. I'm going to take a break when I see that. That is a unit of 115 HP units. Jesus. Well, he did say this was massive. Attacks a unit with 1250 hit points. The attacked unit dies. And the attacking unit has 250 hit points left. Clearly. Legitimately. The... It's not even a game I play. But when I saw this, I thought of Yu-Gi-Oh! The anime i feel bad because i'm old and i don't know what the fuck that is other than i think it's a card game is it a card it's game? similar to Ma it is it's okay. similar to magic the gathering but it has the the point values in the thousands and is it over nine thousand some yeah okay don't. but uh the anime had a, a counter when two things hit up against each other uh similar to two units working with the fast clash attacks mm-hmm and it would do damage to both of them simultaneously, and whichever one was standing afterwards was left standing. If he dies, he dies. I like it. All right. Uh, I got some placement-based attacks. Basically, no damage is modified until an occupied unit occupies some part of their target space. That makes sense. I'm not going to, like, swing and miss and do phantom damage to you. I like that. Ranged units who want to stay outside of their target space has their damage modified by two. Makes ranged units feel less effective, but... <laughs> but that is the point! <laughs> so well said. That has me on a toss-up. Why? <laughs> because Why is that? Ranged units are... Looking historically at battles, looking at war games I've played, looking at video oh, games. Oh no, I've range played, is where it's at. Range yeah. is what you tend to lean into in most of these things I've noticed. So something that specifically makes them feel less effective does make it a more even playing field for the more martial or mundane melee units. Mm hmm. But it also kind of defeats the purpose of having a ranged unit. Fair. That's true. I like ranged units. Don't we all like to shoot people across a room and not have to like swing and miss like 30,000 times? When Reach I play an FPS game, yeah, I'm exactly. shooting you from as far away as I can and occasionally beyond draw distance. Beautiful. All right. Well, then you got a whole bunch of tables, like the tables we talked about before, like how can we hire them? How much they cost, etc. cetera. Uh, the spells here, uh, uh, Jesper, real quick question about these Appendix B, the spells, right? Um, yep. Are these just the spells that are referenced? Uh, yeah. Okay, so there's no change to them physically. No. Okay. No, cool. it's not. The, uh, it's just, I think the most of them are referenced in the theme. Cool. Such, okay, such so they're just the yeah. spells that certain themes can, can use. Got it. Yep. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, the IHP for every single monster in the SRD, which we're going to use for sure in a sec. Um, keep, keep on going. Keep on going. And then the copyright. Well, we've just gone through it all, folks. We've seen it all. We've done it all. And now it is time to fight. All right. Here we go. Here we go, JF. I put a unit together. You put a unit together? JF, you son of a bitch. All right, so what do we got? JF, let's start with you, and then Chris, you, you go next. This will be fun. So I used the Berserker stat block, which okay. gives us an IHP of seven. We have uh, here. This you is said we had. Three enhancement points. Three. Three? Uh, then they are deathless ranged okay 
I'm just going to put that as notes. Deathless and ranged. I depend yes, upon you to tell me what it is that they do with those particular enhancements. Uh, the ranged gives them the ability to make an extra ranged attack with a ranged weapon. Cool. All right. If that's the case... Uh, the deathless... Uh, it's, it's like extra attack. Nice. All right. I'm going to give you control over the Berserker unit so that you can do what you want with it. And the, the Deathless is when this unit is reduced to zero hit points, it drops to one hit point. Instead, it can't use this feature again until fully healed. So there's just like one dude left? <laughs> Amazing. They're Berserkers. It made sense. Okay, let's talk about the size of this unit because how many, do, how many uh, individual members of the unit do we have? Uh, you said we're down for running one that's two full-sized units against each other sure so that is a full set of 100 units that puts it at 700 hp okay so how many so how many squares does that take up at 700 hp uh this is a unit of 100 uh medium creatures so it takes up a 45 by 45 foot square okay so we're talking 15 30 45 bam so it's a three by three on a 15 grid all right there we go there's our unit of berserkers chris what you got um a bit of nonsense we've been talking about flumps so flumps flumps it is um with those three ep points they have wit which means they get vicious mockery based on their wisdom skill nice. and healer. They can heal themselves. I love this so much. Okay, so I'm going to go again in GM notes and say wit and healer. All right. Uh, how many are in this unit? Well, they have an IHP of one. They do indeed. So um, if we say there's like 75 of these uh, bouncing delights. Yes. Times one, that means they have 75. 75 full HP for the unit. And how, how I would assume that because they have 75, that makes them how big of a, of a unit? Is it a 30 by 30 square? Because that goes up to 100, right? Yeah. All righty. Having a hard time what, getting what back to What is the to... size of a plump? Flumps are small size creatures. Yeah. So So seventy five uh, of them, what would that how big of a how big of a square would that be? Tables. That's a forty five by forty five. Oh damn. Forty five by seventy five of them? Yeah, for up to a hundred of them. Holy forty five. Shit, that's amazing. Okay, let me double check and make sure they're not tiny creatures. I thought they were small. They are small. They are small! Yeah. Look at those flumps. Well, the, the small and the medium creatures take up the same sizes. Cool. Yeah. All right, flump. Flump, barbarian. I'm going to have you guys start... Um, How far away from it? Let's see. I'm going to have you guys start 100... I'm going to have you start at, 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 at distance. I'm going to have you guys start 200 feet away from each other. I, I I would say we 190, should 195 feet away from each other. Can we get larger than that? Um, the the ranged weapon I took is a longbow, and if we're starting from before when shots are being fired, I have a range of 600 feet. What's the range of a flump attack? That's not oh, fair. Very far. Well, <laughs> vicious fair. mockery is based on can you hear me? Oh. And flumps are telepathic. Oh no! Oh, what's <laughs> their <laughs> telepathic range? Uh, it's never given as a range that I can find. Um, Does that mean tel like a flump can like do telepathy like for across the world? Like a flump can enter <laughs> my mind across across time and space because it has no feet. range. Sixty, yeah. 60 feet. feet. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Are you regretting your choice, Chris? Oh no, this is going to be chaos. Fuck yeah. See, see, you've misidentified my goal. It's not to win, it's chaos. I love it. This is <laughs> see, you guys are like two birds of a feather flocking together. Let's go. Um now, 
as we said before, these units are going to have commanders. Are we good with that? Uh, yeah, sure. I didn't make a commander. That's okay. Um, I will give you. I'll give you a couple minutes to to make a commander. Um, let's give you a commander with two feats. Two. Choose carefully, because this could sway the tide of the battle. I feel like I, I should put some music on for this, because this is massive battles. So I feel like I should put, like, battle fucking music here. I'm going to be real dumb, because this is a character that I've really only used in one shots. So, uh, I have an idea for what my commander is. That's okay. Let's hear it. Uh, I, I have a paladin cleric that I'm particularly fond of that's very much into battle and combat. <laughs> I love that Chris has a flump like that. She's just like, I have a flump. This is my flump commander. This is amazing. Okay. So tell us the commander of your of your berserker army, JF. Uh, his name is Aesim Bilar. He has Against All Odds. Okay. Great song, um, by the way. Uh, let's go with Standing Strong. Standing Strong. What does that, what does Against All Odds and what does Standing Strong do? Quick, quick uh, recap for those of us who weren't paying attention. Uh, against all odds, when a unit you command is subjected to an overwhelming damage and succeed on your roll, your unit instantly regains a number of hit points equals to equal to your level plus the unit's reliability. Okay. To have two feats. Uh, it depends if you're a fighter or not. Are you are you are you doing a berserker uh, commander? You're doing a berserker. He's commander. a. Uh, uh, I'm going to use the berserker stat block. This is a character that I've played in other one shots. Okay. He just makes sense as a. He's classless, he or niche. is he classless, or does he have like a barbarian, barbarian class? Uh, neither. He just worships the same god as most of the barbarians in the Forgotten Realms. I was just talking about the feats. Like, did you choose certain feats from certain classes, or did you choose cho uh, chose classless? I feats? chose classless feats. Okay, cool. Uh, cool, cool, cool. The other one gives him. Uh, the ability to add the unit's reliability to the DC of a uh, scare tactics roll mm -hmm. when he, the unit is saving against the uh, scare tactics. Okay, so to have two feats means that you're both ninth level commanders, unless you uh, are unless one of you is a fighter. No, even so, you'd still have two feats. Okay. So that's your that's your commander. Let's do, let's go over to the flump army. Chris, who is your flump that's, commander? Uh, my flump commander is um, a cleric. They wear a little miter. Their name is unpronounceable, but sounds mostly like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So cleric commander level nine, two feats. What feats did you choose? I. I have not decided yet. Um, but they're specifically cleric feats, yes? Yeah, I was looking at the class feats, actually. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So for cleric, there's it looks like there's three of them. Blessed Strikes, Divine Healing, and Divine Boon. My iPad oh. kept scrolling past them. There we go. Page 28. Uh, let's go with Blessed Strikes. They Blessed can add strikes. 1d4 to all attack rolls. Okay, okay, okay. And what's the second one? Divine Healing. Divine Once healing. per battle. You may command or action heal all units you command by amount of six-sided dice equal to your proficiency bonus, which you have to remind me what that is. The ninth nine. level. Nine, okay. Ninth level proficiency bonus would be plus three. 
plus three. Yeah, yeah. Okay, All right. Work. Cool. I made it easy on myself and opened a D&B Beyond Character Sheet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So because Chris, the I've commander given... does add IHP and other things as well to a unit. I have given each of you control over your commander units. So we're not going to, uh, just to make things like you said before, we're, although I'd love to bring in reliability and all those wonderful flavor items. Uh, let's keep it simple, Schmimple, and let's just fucking roll initiative. Yeah? So let me give you guys your turn trackers. Remember to click on the token before you roll initiative on the character sheets. And let's make it happen. Let me give you some music. Because what's Dungeons and Dragons without good music? Massive battle, battle, battle. Round one. Fight. I'm honestly trying to remember how to roll initiative on the character sheet. Yeah, it took right. me a moment to... Click on your token, open like up your character sheet, and then there's like a little initiative icon. Multi. Can you find it? Yes. Three. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> okay. And none of you have any kind of special doodads with initiative, correct? Correct. All righty. Let me just fix something here because this uh, is looking very strange. I'm just gonna fix the uh, the pop out. I might have to refresh my screen here. Yeah, yeah, it's not working. Come on, let's try that again. Pop, pop. Okay, let me just refresh my roll twenty. Don't worry, folks. Roll twenty. It just needs a little bit of a kick every once in a while. There we go. There we go. Now we're cooking. All right. Let's go back to our Flumph and Berserker armies fighting on the cold steps of... I don't even know where the hell they are. All right. So the Flumphs are up first with a 19. What are you doing here? All right. Well, all of my Flumphy abilities require me to get much closer to these dreaded foes that have invaded our sacred lands. So, uh, we shall utter a psychic battle cry that <laughs> <laughs> no one can Run hear. <laughs> forward. <laughs> so we've got a flying speed of 30. Okay. So, that's two squares. I believe that puts us, yeah, that far forwards. And then our telepathic range of 60 feet. We're still too far. It's a little, little short. It's going to be a, it's gonna a be little a, short. It's going to be a long battle. So we just float meditatively <laughs> towards your tentacles with you. Now, you probably can probably, I was thinking, like, you could probably spend your action to, um, uh, to, to dash. I could, yeah. Just the full sinister rush. Mm hmm. The silent majesty would just get us. Eye stalks quivering with wrath. God, why did I say flump in the beginning of this episode? Could have been Destiny. anything. And I chose <laughs> flumps. I always choose flumps. All right, is that your turn, Chris? That is my turn. All right, Jeff, you're up. I am going to use the fall back ability. Oh no! <laughs> We're just gonna... He's just gonna keep like oh, throwing. I'm just gonna throw. I, I, I'm trying to remember what. Yeah, so it would be a, a... Yeah. acrobatics or athletics check DC 15. Plus. Your unit. I'm can trying to figure out what this would be without the magic item that's equipped. It would be a, a plus nine for strength and proficiency total by the way folks this is the first time that jf messen has actually played dungeons and Plus dragons seven. on our channel 
I'm just letting you know. This is the first. He's he's commented on many a game. First time playing. So That's a natural one. Yep. Balls. So I don't get the double speed. Nope. Um, and then the unit action. Uh, I'm going to move back my uh, 30 feet. Okay. And then I am going to use the attack action and attack twice. Uh, I think you moved too far because each individual square is 15 feet. So it's only like... Oh, yes. I, I moved... Because uh, you moved... 30 and then 30 again. There we yeah, go. So it would really only move me two squares. Yes. Uh, and then... This is a d20 plus three for two attacks. Okay. What are these, like uh, javelins or something like that? Longbows. Okay. So uh, 22 and a 19 to hit on each of them. Yep. I the think that heats your flumps. AC is 12. Okay. It heats me flumps. How much damage do you do to the flumps? Uh, D8 plus one for each of them. Okay. So seven so and four. 11 damage total. Yeah. And I, then I we think... have a multiplier because of the number of creatures we have. What's uh, that? J j just a rules thingy. Uh, did you use reckless attack or what? Uh, they don't. No, they I only have, not, have one attack. I have not activated that reckless attack ability. But they only they have one to attack. Fall back. Uh, reckless. Uh, the unit type uh, berserkers have that as an ability. It's part of their stat block, so they still get that. But I didn't use it. It only applies to melee weapon attack rolls. Yeah, true. But but they only have one attack, too. Not two. Berserkers? Uh, I, t I took the ranged uh, martial. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Which uh, in the rules says that yeah. uh, it gives you an extra attack and it ignores the loading property of some weapons like crossbows. Hot. Yeah. So he's got reckless ranged barbarians. I, I don't have reckless ranged. Oh, just ranged the barbarians. Reckless, yeah, the reckless only, only applies to melee attacks. They're also proficient with great axes. Right on. Okay. So you shoot twice, hitting uh, both times, doing 11 damage total times. 11 damage multiplied by 4 because of the unit numbers. Correct. 44 HP damage. Ooh. Oh no. <laughs> and there's something about uh, let me double check because ranged armies deal damage different. Yeah, there was something about it being halved. Uh, no, that's just a modified rule. So, so the flump Shoot army them. takes forty-four damage. Yeah. All right. That drops, I believe, a couple things. One, it drops you down to thirty-one total unit hit points. And since it's yep. under 50, I believe that drops you from a 3x3 three three square to a 2x2 two two square. The question I have for you is, how do you want to shrink your flump army? Uh, forwards. So shrink them forwards. <laughs> got it. Yeah, okay. shrink them forwards. You got it. We shrink forwards. <laughs> like that? It. Solid. All right. The back half of your flump army is just impaled by arrows, and yet they inexorably move forward. Slowly, slowly. All right. I think that is that the end of your turn, Berserker army. That is, I believe, that also leaves us at the same distance we started at because we both it moved. Could very well yeah. be. Okay. Maybe I should have put you guys closer in together. You know what? A giant wind blows! And the, flump, the, flump, <laughs> the flump army comes 60 feet... No, wait. 15, 20, 30, 40, 75 feet forward. 
advantage of being mostly air. Aerodynamic. Flubs. <laughs> I can interpose myself any way I want on the goddamn DM. Um, <laughs> and now it is the Flumpster. All right. Uh, and the commander gets an action we've before, established pre the, the before units. Before the unit's turn, that's correct. So... The tentacles will wave in healing divine patterns, and I will heal my unit an amount of six sided dice equal to my proficiency bonus. Established for level nine, so mm -hmm. that's a proficiency of three. Three d six. Three d six. Come over here to the little tray thing. D six, and then three. So you get a fifteen back. So your flumps regenerate. How they do, I do not know. They just reinflate slowly and the arrows <laughs> pop out. <laughs> Amazing. You're up to 40. What was it 45? Let's see. 46. 46. 46 hit points. All right. Yes. Your commander in, uh, instills uh, a certain amount of bravery into your re energized flumps. All right. And I will. I will float forwards and I will use my telepathy to viciously mock your solid fleshy forms and temerity to dare approach our sacred plans. This is a wisdom save? Yes, let me just triple check that. Nothing. There we go. Yes, saving throws equal to eight plus proficiency bonus of three plus spell casting ability, which is wisdom based. So, two, three, five plus eight, thirteen is your DC. All right, and this is a straight roll for these guys. So, Boop. that's a four. All right, you have disadvantage on all attacks you make during your next turn. Any damage? Um, it does not list it here. Usually, vicious mockery does do damage, though. That is true. Uh, it does. You do because two uh, d four. Two d damage. Yes, you do two d four. Yeah. That's and for the it, whole unit, or does it multiply by the number of? It, it, it is to the unit. Um, and it is multiplied by two because the unit strength is under 50. I believe. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's 1d4, and then you multiply it after that. Sorry. Okay, so let's roll that d4 first. Yeah. Uh, Three. It is the 2d4 because she's her character is 9th level, not uh, 11th, so she gets the 2d4 from the cantrip rather than the 3d4 cool all right so that's and it's it's still times four because you're over half your uh units that you had right that's correct yeah is she over she is over her half her halfway point yeah because healed healed. she healed i don't know what your current hp is 46 out of 75. <laughs> okay so she got uh, oh, three. sorry. Then, then it's only times two. Okay. Because it's uh, depending on the Under amount the of unit units. Count of 50, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and your IO because AHP she's the smaller size. Okay, so yeah. it's five times four. Yeah. Five times two. Five times two. Sorry, not time. Five, five, five times two. So there you go. So ten, ten, ten and uh, and disadvantage on the next attack roll. Jesus. Is we'll just your core by our flumpy insults. She's dropped down from 700 hit points <laughs> to 690. Yes, and now they're within 30 feet, so I'm huh? going to use the... Uh... The Reckless Charge ability? Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Dropping your I'm bows. going to do persuasion strength versus that DC 18, and I hope this goes through. Funny. 
and plus four. So 17, it does not pass the DC. Gah, so that means the charge doesn't happen? Uh, the effects of the reckless charge doesn't happen. The unit is still going to attack recklessly. And, okay. Uh, still run up. They're just yeah. yeah they're they're running fuel. up their thirty feet, and they are oh god making their uh, one attack or two attacks. One. I uh, I was double checking the the stat block on the berserker itself. Yeah, it, it is. One with the great axe at a five. At disadvantage. That's straight roll because they're attacking recklessly. Oh, very nice. You got to move in there. You got to you got to get you guys to move in there. So that is a total of a twelve. Does your does it hit your, your AC? That misses my AC. Oh Just my God. scrapes past them. <laughs> what the hell? All right. Well, they are now engaged. The All wrath right. of flumps in melee. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> there's, there's like a whole bunch of flumps that are like, I've made a terrible mistake. I'm so sorry. I'm ready to leave now. Can I please? I mean, this is bad. It's really bad. Ah, so Commander Damn. Flump wiggles her tentacles, blessing the unit of flumps. They now have the blessed status. They can add 1d4 to all of their attack rolls and saving throws for a number of turns equal to my proficiency bonus. So next three turns. Oh, wow. Adding a d4. Hashtag blessed flumps. Who knew? Yes. And then they're going to try to stab you with their tendrils using the tendril attack. Which uh, is... The AC you're up against is 13. Let's see. What do I... Alright. And you also uh, you also roll with advantage against them. Yep, you roll with advantage because Because I of the reckless, reckless, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if I click tendrils. And do I just click it twice for advantage uh, no, or right. does it show up there? It it should be it should show up uh, with two yeah. numbers. Okay, there we go. Except I'm not showing that for some reason. Uh, uh, I'm seeing it as she rolled a, a six and a twelve. Yeah, yeah, the numbers yeah. are not coming through, but it is a 6 and a 12. So yeah. with your d4, you will hit the... Yep. That's right. Yep, you get Because of the 12 d4 plus the d4 yeah. bless. That, that hits. The, uh, the AC. Roll that sweet, yeah. sweet flump damage. All right. So... It will do 1d4 plus 2... Times. Piercing normal times. Another... So, it does total a total of, of six piercing damage plus two d four. So plus d two d four acid damage. Oof! So that's more five. Eleven. So that's a total yeah. of twenty-two. There we go. Yeah. Let's go, flumps. And. Now, at the, uh, you must make, at the end of each of your turns, a DC-10 con saving throw or take more acid damage. Oh my gosh. Who and knew? that's it for the devastation of the flumps. <laughs> Part two of The Hobbit. <laughs> devastation <laughs> of the flump. You asked for this content, folks. I'm just letting you know, okay? You asked for it. You're welcome. It was Destiny. Destiny yeah. just put flumps right in from the beginning. Does that end your turn? I believe. It does, yes, you may go. Go for it. All right, in this situation, the only uh, commander action that seems viable to me when we're engaged like this, I can't use the reckless charge. I could try to increase my uh, initiative but given the rules, it's not really worth the try. Yeah, it's just back uh, and forth and back and forth. I am going to inspire troops. I'm going to roll a DC 16 with a 
This character has 13, so a plus one. Nope, nope. He's he's not a very effective commander. This guy. This but guy. But they are going to attack recklessly with the, the great axe. Alrighty, again. alrighty. Let's go. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's a, a twenty to hit total. Yeah, that hits their AC of twelve. Oh my goodness. Uh, for a D12 plus three. So 13 multiplied by four is 52. 52. Oh, I no. You destroyed the clubs. No. Stand for <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It was a valiant try, but the flubs hit the ground. <laughs> It's like the Cornates against, uh, oh god, the Tau. Yes. Oh, the Tau. Yeah, well, the Tau would never charge. The Tau would just stand back and, like, let their, like, fucking, their ridiculous giant mech suits just level everything. But, yeah. Uh, so go the way of all things. Um, the slaughter of the flumps. The, sl the devastation of the flumps. The desecration of flump land. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's just a taste of amazing, massive combat that's, as you can see here, folks, super easy, just between two units, uh, a little bit overpowered, one versus the other, I'm just saying, Chris chose the flumps, uh, out of flavor, and Jeff was like, fuck flavor, I'm just gonna kill you. <laughs> I just picked Berserkers because I saw him on the list. And that's fair, that's completely for a sec. <laughs> All right, so there you go. That's that's massive. That's massive combat in a nutshell. Um, hey, what do you guys think, Chris? Let's start with you. What, what's your impression? I liked it. It's very easy. It's fast. I have a math phobic brain. My brain sees numbers and just runs screaming. But like, I was able to pick this up pretty quickly, implement it, run it, make PDFs, and hand it to people I surprised. Explain it to them in a minute. And then they spent like the next two hours having a blast. We just made commanders and armies while you were talking and we were talking to you. We're like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, okay. Army. Fair. Nice. Uh, JF. I like this system a lot with a little more practice. I would honestly run a campaign where most, if not all, the combat happens in this format. I love the idea of a grand scale campaign like that, um, especially if you're looking for a way to transfer your characters from tier two into tier three play going above 10th level or above 15th level. At that point, they're kind of becoming renowned figures in older editions. You'd be seeing them become Lords of Castle and this gets back a little bit to the first and second edition roots where you would have a castle and followers and raise armies. And I love that. I love that it fits fifth edition so well. And I love how simple it is for people to be able to do the math. I have a little bit of an easier time with that because I like the crunchy things. So it's complex enough that someone like me can sit there and write formulas to figure out how things go and just have a grand old time doing that while staying simple enough for pretty much anybody else to pick up because it's all base 10 based on the original stat block. Exactly. Yeah. I, uh, I love it. I can't get enough of it. I've, uh, watched, uh, I, I've, I've, I remember when you first came to me with this, uh, uh, Jesper and I was like, yeah, yes this is what's missing like they don't have this shit or if they do have it it's not as good as yours is um and each iteration of it gets better and cooler um and i was super psyched i'm, I'm only sad that we waited so long to do it honestly uh but we know that there's gonna be more cool shit coming uh from you uh you know in 2023 and this is this is just one of the amazing things that you've given to us as a gift and we thank you for it uh yeah. Any remarks from your side, Jesper? Uh, no, not at all. I just uh, wanted to thank the three of you for checking out my 
small little booklet. Uh, it's uh, it's been very helpful, and I have uh, two pages of notes here that I'm gonna work on. <laughs> one, <laughs> one thing that um, that uh, uh, some folks in our chat here are recommending um, yep. are uh, if the supplement does not already include it, a section on how to create interesting battle situations may be helpful. And I think yeah. that's that's a really great point, actually. Um, yeah. So thank you for that chat. Um, perfect. Um, One and... point I'd note for you, Jasper, is uh, yeah. take a look at what the sizes would be on a hex grid map as oh, well. Oh, damn. Yeah. You're going to hex on um, this now. Yeah, it, it does work for different kinds of tactical things, and it gives a not the orthogonal movement but more directions of movement uh yeah. to yeah. allow units to reposition and all of that one thing i also yeah. thought would be kind of cool is how would units that are um like with certain tactics like you ever see uh in certain um uh, uh military uh, uh videos or what have you that they still like show like uh, like a top down of a map or something like that and where units like do a pincer move like where they pincer in an army unit like how would how would certain tactics applied on the battlefield apply to certain units like would they be demoralized would they find themselves at disadvantage would they be able to uh with with the attacking units that are doing a specific tactic successfully have that advantage if need be yeah, can you apply the planking combat rules from 5e to this? And it feels like you could very easily. Yep. Yeah. The, the advantage disadvantage cool. system. Actually, when writing this last update, I was thinking about that um, uh, with the um, positioning. Uh, what did I call it? Placement based attacks. That's because cool. uh, adding adding that would be so easy. It's just yeah. yeah. Um. Awesome. Uh, and I just want to say, if anyone wants to get hold of this, you can become my patron. Um, uh, I release maps for free, usually, and this is five bucks on my patron, the lowest tier. Best five bucks uh, I spend every month. Gotta be honest. Um, links to uh, Jesper's Patreon uh, slash uh, website uh, of Sirens Maps uh or siren's maps is his proper pronunciation um uh it will be listed here in the youtube after uh this is, goes up on youtube well probably tomorrow morning um but otherwise those of you who are in chat say hi uh because he's here in chat and thank you all for being part of this awesome group check i want to say thank you of course to my awesome two other heads jf and chris who have spent the time with us tonight to do so and Unless there's anything else, thank you, of course, to Jesper, and thank all of you for hanging out. And uh, check out the Veteran's Guide to War, because it's dope as shit, and you should use it for mass combat. That's all I got. Thank you all, and uh, we'll see each other again tomorrow. Um, there is the final stream of the year. Holy shit. Um, which is our Ravenloft campaign, starting tomorrow night at 9 p.m. So... Catch you all then. Until we see each other again, folks, remember, take care of each other. Don't forget to take care of yourselves. Bye, everybody.